Xbox On. Welcome to Xbox On, the podcast with one host about one console, the Xbox One. I am said host, Jesse DeRosa, and on today's episode, we'll be talking about the latest Xbox news for the week of February 27th, 2020, including Phil Spencer talks about the future of Project X Cloud and monetization in gaming. Spencer also publishes a post on Xbox Wire detailing and confirming some more specs about the undoubtedly beefy Xbox Series X. EA reportedly canceled a Star Wars Battlefront spinoff recently, Mixer may be in some trouble, and more. love how that beautiful like string intro from halo 5 is what leads right into me talking about like excessive fast food eating and weird comments from my nephew using the pen name tim treadless speaking of which let's start out with uh, some comments from last week's show shout outs mentions from the audience first comment of course being from tim treadless my, my good buddy tim who says you can't stop me i'm blowing my load well mr treadless let's Certainly hope you clean up nice and well before Miss Treadless comes home to uh, a blown load, a messy blown load. Our next comment is from Mr. Andrew Nuremberg, who says, I have high hopes that with the Series X, they will finally be more universal with gaming headsets like PC and Sony are with USB. Here's hoping. I think that was a very like uh, pre-Spencer kind of move to to do that more proprietary headset they initially had. And then, you know, when they added 3.5 millimeter headphone jacks to the later uh, Xbox controllers. That's when it got a little more friendly, but yeah, still no like real USB powered headset compatibility with the Xbox One consoles. I don't. I can't think for a second that that's going to be the case with the Series X and beyond. I think for sure that's something they'll address. But yeah, that is kind of a weird quirk about the Xbox One to point out. It's one of those. It's one of those things that they weren't able to like retroactively fix about the console from its original inception. And now it's just kind of st- stuck around the entire generation. But I have no, uh, I have no doubt they'll address that with the Series X. And then our next comment from Josiah, my my brother says, I think that a double A game, I think that the double A genre still exists. It's just not quite the same. I would say that the Outer Worlds kind of falls into that category, but we don't see it that way because Microsoft bought Obsidian at the end of development. I guess the games are generally bigger than they used to be, but even on the smaller end, you still have like ukulele and things like that. But as a whole, I do see your point. It feels like everything is giant or indie now. King Kong on Xbox 360 was an incredible game. So I get what you mean that it's sad to see that kind of genre or that kind of game gone now. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. I guess Outer Worlds technically is kind of like a a second party double A game. I mean, obviously, it's well, it's not really a first party game because it was published by someone else and it's on all hardware. But yeah, I think I think Obsidian's kind of an example of a of that kind of developer, but usually the games they make are more AAA. I mean, I, I would say most of their games are pretty AAA, uh, but The Outer Worlds is, I guess, kind of that. I, I guess what I mean is there's something about, like, the AA space, and, and THQ Nordic, I think, is is the publisher that really fulfills that that market these days, but there's something about that AA space that was just so, uh, it was so, like, unabashedly just a video game, those kinds of games, and nothing more. Like, like AAA games really aspire to, like, push gaming forward with like to say like this is what the biggest budget most highly produced most finely tuned game can be that's kind of what a triple a game says and then an indie game is like this is how you can use you know the least amount of people and the smallest amount of of capital to make the most impactful and thought-provoking and kind of i don't know like solid game whereas Whereas you look at like the double A space and the double A space usually does like neither of those things. Double A space is usually just like, here's a game that kind of looks like something that would be triple A, but it's really not. And it's inception isn't like, I don't know, it's, it's concept and setting and it's, and it's story and it's mechanics usually aren't anything to write home about too much. It's usually just like unabashedly a video game by the most standard definition possible. And what I mean by that is like, I think a perfect example would be like, a game like Destroy All Humans or a game like Mercenaries, you know, those kinds of double A, those kind, those kinds of double A games that you used to see like 15 years ago, where it's like there's nothing about Destroy All Humans that like screams triple A or indie by any stretch of the imagination, and it's not a, it's not like a. Uh, an industry defining game it's not the kind of game that people are going to talk about for years and years to come but it's the kind of game that is was completely fun to play at the time and it just really serves the need of like 
people want to play a video game with fun video game mechanics. This game is a stupid fun video game with fun video game mechanics. It has a lot of like budgetary quirks where like the games maybe don't look the absolute best or the writing and the storytelling and the pacing is really wonky and kind of stupid, but it's a fun game nonetheless and it does what it's supposed to do best, which is just being a video game. And that's what I really lament the most with the big kind of hole in the middle of the industry where we used to see the double A games uh, because every, th- every game just aspires to say something and be something. But I really do miss those games that were just kind of like junk food that were just, you know, you played it because it was fun and you knew the story was going to be bad and you knew the polish was going to be like almost there, but not quite. And you knew the game wasn't going to be the most impressive in terms of its scale and scope, but it was just going to be a good time. But I don't know. I I don't want to rant too much about that because I did that a lot last week, but I think you get the point. And then Lethal Migraine com- comes in and says, Remedy would be a good purchase for Xbox. Xbox makes so much money off Game Pass, it would be feasible to own them. I'm not entirely sure how the two are correlated. I, I guess what you're trying to say there is that, you know, you don't need Remedy games to sell super well in order to justify the purpose because a lot purchase because a lot of people will just play their games for free via Game Pass. So it doesn't matter if you sell copies of them or not. People will play Remedy games as long as they have Game Pass, which I guess that's a good point. But yeah, I think, I, I, I think this is what I said last week, so I won't tread on it too much but uh yeah remedy i think really fits the xbox portfolio nicely i think they really offer a lot of what xbox has been lacking and what they've been looking for which is why i thought it was so nice that they were a close partner with xbox through the alan wake and quantum break days and why it kind of sucks to see them stray so much from xbox with control and and going forward not that i don't want you know playstation gamers to have access to remedy games but it it just seemed like a really good fit for Xbox. And it seems kind of like a missed opportunity for Microsoft not to jump on that and buy them. But who knows, maybe Remedy refuses to be purchased or maybe Microsoft doesn't see them as financially viable and doesn't see them being worth it. Um, I mean, and they wouldn't be entirely wrong. Control, from what we know, really didn't sell as well as Remedy keeps saying it did. So who knows? But yeah, I would love to see Remedy become part of the uh, Xbox Studios lineup. Uh, And then my my older brother comes in with our last comment here. He says, in defense of my rant about Disney games the other week, he says, in all fairness, Disney's, if you will, golden age of gaming was the 80s and 90s, uh, where they did license out their properties and publish to developers like Capcom, Sega, Sony, IDOS, and Activision to make wonderful experiences like the Illusion series, the DuckTales games, the Pixar games, and more. Games that Disney fans still enjoy to this day. Well, yeah, yes, correct. And I think most gamers probably do, for better or for worse. I don't really think it's because these games were better. I think it's more just because it's cool to be nostalgic and think the Super Nintendo was the hottest shit. But yeah, people are really into things like Aladdin and and Lion King and Castle of Illusion and DuckTales and all these like NES and SNES era Disney games. And yes, but what I was referring more to was the era of like the mid 2000s, the early mid 2000s, when Disney was like, hey, what if we had our own publishing branch? And what if we had our own in-house developers? And what if we made our own games? I just think that's cool because Disney, historically at least, is like, you know, they're they're creatives. They they make their own movies. They have their own studio that develops and, and creates their own movies. And then they have their own publishing arm that that distributes their movies. And it would just be cool to see them take that same kind of approach to gaming, but they've never really invested the time or money, even when they were a publisher and a developer to really fully explore that space. Nor do I think they ever will, especially now that we got the news that Bob Iger has stepped down and been replaced by someone who is like undoubtedly a worse successor. It will probably never, ever, ever see Disney go back into that space. So I wouldn't hold your breath, but I was just lamenting that era specifically because I really enjoyed when Disney tried to make their own games rather than taking the lazy approach of letting other people do the work, even if the work that the other people did was fantastic, which we saw, yes, back in the the days of DuckTales and those SNES games. But we also see it now in the form of like, Marvel's Spider-Man from 2018 and um, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. So it's it's not a lose-lose for sure. It's just different is all I'm saying. So that's it for our comments, shout-outs, and uh, whatever audience kind of input from last week. Remember, for those of you who haven't before, don't be shy. Reply. Next, let's get into what I've been playing. But, of course, before we get into what I've been playing, let me tell you what I've been eating. And this week we're just going to blast through this because I'm not proud of what I'm about to say. But, yes... I did indulge, if you can, if indulge can be used in the sentence, uh, in some CeCe's pizza, which I highly regret. 
I got a coupon. I got a deal. I doubled up. I got these all these pizzas for next to nothing. And I thought it was going to be awesome. I thought I was going to go home and have a pizza party. I thought everyone was going to think I was cool. I thought I was going to eat a bunch of pizzas for next to no money and then pass out and, and be like, oh, what the fuck happened last night? But instead, instead I deeply regret it. I, I've never had this issue with CCs in the past, but apparently as you get older, CCs doesn't really work well with your digestive system, and I just felt like shit. So that's not gonna that's not going to happen again. And I'm not going to endorse CCs or tell you to go out and enjoy it because it's not worth it. But from there, we are absolutely going to jump into what I've been playing. This week, I played a little more Halo 4. Gotta love that Halo 4. Uh, Not much to say there. But I finally, after weeks or months of bitching and moaning and saying I would get to it, I finally begun playing Hellblade. So uh, I'm not done with it. I'll I'll finish over the course of the next week. It's really not a long game, so there's no reason why I can't beat it soon. But uh, yeah, it's good. It's, It's like people say, Hellblade is very good. I don't know what I was expecting, but so far I'm only like three hours into it. Something about the narrative aspect, while I'm interested in the game and I want to see it through the end and I want to pay attention to it, I'm not like engrossed in it the way I thought I would be immediately. I mean, I'm playing with headphones on, I'm trying to play at night, I'm trying to do the whole like immersion thing because I know the binaural audio is a big part of the experience, but I'm not really enamored with the storytelling so far, but I'm hoping we get there. I'm hoping there's some... There's some beats uh, in the in the narrative at some point that really turn things around. But that aside, I am enjoying it as a puzzle game. I am enjoying it as a walking simulator, which is one of my favorite genres. And I'm definitely enjoying it as a combat game. Even though the combat is light in this game, there's not too much of it. I enjoy it quite a bit. Ninja Theory, obviously, they have a, a pedigree with third-person hack and slash kind of action games. Um, so it makes sense that the combat would be good in this game. But yeah, I, I like the combat quite a bit in this game. And I actually, I think some of the most interesting parts narratively are the combat sequences. So I'm definitely enjoying that. I'm excited to get further into the game and to finish it so I can have more like fleshed out thoughts. Um, but I, it feels good to finally be addressing the game, to finally be playing it. And I'm excited to see kind of where it goes. So Hellblade. And then lastly, I lost a bet with my brother, you know, Dead Captain James, who usually comments on the show, mentioned how he's played like 400 hours of Anthem, and he mentioned that like right after I shit all over it about how EA shouldn't really be giving Bioware the opportunity to rework the game. It's kind of a lost cause at this point. And then my brother was kind of also defending the game as well, saying that, you know, this is really one of those the media got away with the narrative, but the game really is better than people say this kind of things. And then I saw that the game was on sale for like $9 this week, like literally $9 right now on Xbox you can get there's an EA sale going on right now and Anthem is nine dollars. It's like eleven dollars for the for the nicer deluxe edition. And I was just like, you know what, for nine bucks, why the fuck not? I don't want to be one of those blindly hating something because it's cool to hate kind of people. So let me download this game. Let me see what nine dollars uh if nine dollars can be worth it for Anthem. And while I haven't really gotten into the game, I've literally just played the first hour of it. I will say, right off the bat, Anthem is much better than I gave it credit for. I don't give a shit about the story. I'm, I'm probably, I'll probably, I'll be really honest. I'm probably just going to very intentionally write off the story because I don't want to care. Um, that's not what I come to play these kinds of games for. So I'm not really going to be judging in that regard. But immediately, right off the bat, the flight mechanics, the combat mechanics, just the the controls, the game feels really good and really tight. And I really like it immediately. Right off the bat, I'm like, this gameplay loop is addictive. I see the the parallels with a game like Destiny, and it's like all for the better in, in my opinion. I'm like, this is a game I can see myself like putting a good 20, 30 hours into and having a good time. Um, and I'm actually pretty excited once I finish Hellblade to jump like full swing into Anthem and kind of give it a fair shake. I would like to be in the camp of this game is better than people gave it credit for because, like I said, I like Bioware. I like I want to like all games. I want to support all developers. I don't want to see especially a studio like Bioware fail and and have a big flop like this. So I'm not trying to look for ways to hate this game. In fact, my the one hour I've spent with it thus far has actually impressed me quite a bit. So I'm excited to jump back into that. Uh, who knows? Maybe I, I might even come out at the end of this as an Anthem defender. Who fucking knows? Um, so yeah, that's what I've been playing this week. And now we'll get into this week's news. All right. So this week, not like too many stories, but our first two stories here are like big, long ones from um, from Phil Spencer. None of that was an innuendo. I'm just being frank. These are some meaty stories to divulge. Um, So let's just jump right into the first one. And this comes directly from IGN. The article reads, Xbox boss Phil Spencer recently talked about 
where he thinks Microsoft will be taking gaming in the future, beyond the next generation Xbox Series X, specifically when it comes to business models, monetization, and cloud streaming services. Spencer joined Insomniac Games CEO Ted Price for an hour-long episode at AIAS, Game Maker's Notebook podcast, to discuss, quote, what lies ahead for Xbox and Project X Cloud through monetization, among other topics. And let me just quick side note before we go into this. Ted Price, CEO of Insomniac, now a Sony-owned studio, but once worked closely with Xbox at the beginning of the Xbox One era with, of course, Sunset Overdrive, which was an excellent Xbox One exclusive that not enough people played. Interesting to see those two people together on a podcast, especially when Insomniac had a recent history with Microsoft and then more recently just got bought out by Sony after having a very long history with Sony. So that's an interesting one there. But continuing on with the story, it says, One major topic centered around whether he thinks the industry will move forward from console wars to cloud wars in the future. He says, quote, I hope not, which he, which uh, his immediate reply, I think I'm going to have a gaming console plugged into my television for the next decade plus. I think the best way for me to play on my television is going to be having a device that downloads the games I want to play. But sometimes I'm not going to be able to be in front of my television. Sometimes I'm not going to be in front of a device that has native capability to play. That's our bet on the cloud. Microsoft, Google, PlayStation, and NVIDIA, and the rest are all competing competitors moving towards game streaming services, but they still have a lot to learn when it comes to monetization and input, according to Spencer. But his hopes is that it will encourage game developers to be more active and creative with their games in the future. He says, quote, once you get through the pragmatics of making a game playable on multiple screen sizes, then you get to the promise, Spencer said. You start talking about, well, wait a minute. Now, if my game isn't just dependent on this one piece of hardware that someone maybe five years ago bought in the home, but actually something that a large cloud provider is updating on the back end and is scalable, then what can I do with our games? This is a very cool future up and down. How do we scale the cloud computer to the creative experiences that somebody wants to deliver? Spencer also thinks that rather than having one machine that plays games, in the future we'll have multiple devices in our home that we play games on. He looks at how we can listen to music and watch TV on a number of devices these days, whereas in the past it was just one. This is why Spencer thinks you'll have many game playing machines under your TV and across multiple rooms going forward he continues quote one of the things that's always bummed me out about consoles is that usually i have one tv in my house that a console is plugged into that idea that i can't go from any tv in my house and sit down and play games on i want to go play we should have that ability this is apparently what spencer is already seeing people do with the microsoft's x cloud preview he says quote the number of people that send me pictures of their android tablets that they've mounted mounted to certain places and have created control setups Uh, He said people going out buying specific devices so that they can remote play or different streaming scenarios from their console to different screens. I think that we're early on in that journey. It's going to be a lot of fun. Another important part of the journey from Spencer is coming up with new business models. He says, quote, our point of view as Microsoft and Xbox is that there's not one business model to rule them all. We actually think it's healthy not only for our industry from a monetization standpoint, but also from a creative standpoint. If multiple business models will work, Spencer said, I think for us as an industry, we should embrace monetization dexterity because I think it leads to the best creativity. Thinking on how business models need to diversify in the future, Spencer explains that he recently went to Africa where there was a bus uh, that had a business model for earning credits Basically, when you uh, want to play a game on this little tablet on the bus, basically you watch an ad. It gives you five minutes of playtime, but he he and then, you know, you can go back and forth with that. But then he says uh, it's kind of a pay to earn or play to earn system as two kinds of new ways in which you can do gaming. While he isn't exactly sure about how that if that would work, it's definitely an option. And so he continues by saying, quote, could that be a model that works in games? Well, absolutely. I think it could. I don't know if we're going to completely mirror that business model with what we have today. It's not necessarily free to play and it's not necessarily ad funded. It's something different. However, Spencer also thinks that game developers need to be careful when looking into new business models. And this is a really important part in the ending part of the article. It says, he warns against finding new ways to get money out of existing players. The 200 million console owners that exist currently are not actually growing the business and that's, quote, dangerous for the industry. Instead, he urges towards attracting new players. He says, quote, I think we need to find new players and new forms of monetization to open up those new player bases and new ways to build games, new creativity and new great paths to grow, he said. So that's a really long article. I didn't really really know how to condense it because I felt like it was all kind of relevant. But the ending point in particular is really the main sticking point for me is him saying that he warns against saying this is a new way to monetize gaming 
let's attach it to what we already have. And I think why this is important is because we already see this being an issue where the kind of free-to-play loot box stuff, we've just tacked it on in modern gaming. And maybe it's something that doesn't really make sense for the AAA space. Maybe it's not really something you should be doing on your Xbox One game is throwing in the loot boxes. But maybe it's something that works in like a free-to-play iPhone game. And I like this idea that, you know, we need to explore new ways to get people to buy games and to play games and engage with games, new ways to make them financially viable because not every game, you're not going to always attain a player base if you make everything free to start or $60 to start or more or less. Just whatever you do, there's so many ways to monetize gaming and it really shouldn't be a cut and clear, well, this is how we do it on Xbox. We've always done it this way on game hardware, so this is how it has to be done. He's saying... Well, no, because the people who currently play video games on consoles, we've kind of capped that to an extent. You know, obviously, that number can grow or shrink a little bit here or there, but somewhat negligible, whereas we want to grow the market by getting people who don't play home console games traditionally. This is anywhere from, like, grandmas to little kids to, you know, people in countries where they don't buy consoles. And we can do this by offering them ways to play on different kinds of technology, whether that be something where you download games or something where you stream games. But the point is, because because the barrier to entry, because we have to find this middle point where developers and publishers and, and companies are making money off their games, but it's attractive enough for consumers to get in the door, we have to explore monetization to say, you know, for this specific scenario, how does it make sense to monetize it? Is this a is this a is this a piece of hardware someone's playing on where they're going to download a game? Are they going to stream the game? So what kind of game can it be if that's the case? And then also, you know, what's the screen size going to be? What's the input method going to be? Who's going to be playing this game? Is it some would people pay money to buy this game? Would people pay money to rent this game for a set period of time? Would people deal with ads in order to interact with this game for for a couple minutes? And this is I, this goes all over the place. It's with your phone. It's with uh, a phone like a, a tablet or something in a doctor's office waiting room it's with a screen attached to the seat in front of you on a public transit bus it's it's anything from you know your home computer to your xbox series x it's so many different devices and what spencer's saying is we can't approach it all the same way because that doesn't work and it's kind of proven itself to not work and i think that's really smart for better or for worse you know for all of us i i think when people like spencer talk about growing gaming to you know the seven billion people in the world he's not talking about growing gaming in the way that we know gaming he's not talking about you know going from 20 mil 20 million people playing star wars jedi fallen order to getting billions of people across the world to play star wars jedi fallen order on an xbox ps4 or pc he's talking about getting billions of people across the world to find some input method of gaming that, you know, makes them engage enough to the part where we can like statistically consider that person a gamer, whether that be, you know, angry birds on an iPhone or streaming some Xbox game on an Android tablet or whatever it is, but it's about, you know, trying to get gaming into more hands. So you're not going to grow Xbox by making the best halo game ever, the best home console ever, and then selling it to billions of people. You're going to grow the Xbox brand by finding new ways to think about gaming, new ways to get people in the door and new platforms for them to engage on. And that's why platforms like project X project X cloud are so critical because you're not going to get some guy in Nigeria to just drop 600 bucks on Xbox series X and halo infinite and just be a gamer the same way the dude in California is gaming. It's just not how it's worked. So rather than Xbox expecting that to be the case, you're going to look at that market and say, how can we get this market engaged in gaming? And maybe it's something as simple as, introducing some form of project x cloud to some form of technology that people in this part of the world normally engage with and maybe the game's different maybe the way they monetize the game is different but nonetheless it's still getting people engaged in gaming people engaged with xbox gaming and i think this is a really smart way to think about it although of course judging by the way i'm articulating it and judging by the way it's written in this article we're still speaking in very early phase very vague terms very um just very un large unknowns. This is a lot of variables. This is a lot of, there's so much room to explore and to test and to figure out where we can go with this. But I think just this train of thought is really interesting, thought provoking, and it's fun to explore because these are the kinds of vague concepts that are really going to evolve our, our understanding of what gaming can be for better or for worse. You know, I'm always going to be the kind of jaded old grumpy man that wants to play nothing but a home console and a triple A game or something like that. I'm not really ever going to, you know, 
mobile gaming with smartphones never really grab my attention, nor will it ever. But that doesn't mean we can't evolve Xbox and we can't grow our concept of gaming in general uh, in different ways for other players. And I think that's really what this conversation is all about. Moving on to our next story of the week, but keeping with Phil Spencer. So this was maybe the more notable story for most gamers because this is about the next generation particularly. Um, But yeah, Phil Spencer published an article on the Xbox Wire directly talking about just kind of confirming some specs about the Xbox Series X and talking about kind of some of the features that will really make this console super powerful and uh, super next gen. And so basically this was his breakdown without all the uh, opening and closing paragraphs and just kind of getting into the the meat of it. He talked about, he he categorized some of the features into different like subcategories. Um, So the first category he dissected was uh, he calls a superior balance of power and speed. So Spencer, and I, I highlighted the most important part in each subcategory, but the first one is uh, next generation custom processor. So he says Xbox Series X is the most powerful console ever powered by our custom design processor, leveraging AMD's latest Zen 2 and RDNA 2 architectures, delivering four times the processing power of the Xbox One and enabling developers to leverage 12 teraflops of GPU performance, twice of that of the Xbox One X, and and more than eight times that of the original Xbox One. The Series X delivers true next-gen leap in processing graphics, more cutting-edge techniques resulting in higher frame rates, larger, more sophisticated game worlds, etc., etc. He also talks about variable rate shading. He says, our patented form of VRS empowers developers to more efficiently utilize the full power of the Xbox Series X rather than spending the GPU cycles uniformly to evenly... To every single pixel on the screen, they can prioritize individual effects on specific game characters or important environmental objects. This technique results in more stable frame rates and a higher resolution with no impact on the final image quality. The last one here is the hardware accelerated direct X ray tracing. You can expect more dynamic and realistic environments powered by hardware accelerated ray tracing. A first for console gaming. This means true life lighting, accurate reflections and realistic acoustics in real time as you explore game worlds. So when I think about this ray tracing, the first thing I think about is Hellblade 2 and that trailer we got with the ridiculously beautiful lighting and all that. Um, but I think the most important one here, or the most, the one I'm most comfortable talking about, at least as someone who really struggles with understanding kind of this more tech related stuff, the next generation custom processor, the teraflops thing, obviously teraflops has been something of a buzzword, especially in the Xbox realm ever since the Xbox one X, but 12 teraflops, there was a lot of rumors about, you know, will this console console have nine or 9.2 or will the PS five reach 12 and which one's going to have more teraflops and everyone thought it was series X, but then those reports from a few weeks ago kind of suggested that the PS five will actually have a lot of teraflops as well. But this kind of cements that 12 teraflops double that the Xbox one X and to my, my, my tiny baby brain, my understanding of teraflops is essentially that like, this is the, the potential for the most like amount of things that the system can comprehend or the, the amount of inputs that a uh, a system can comprehend at once, which like theoretically adds to more potential graphical power, but doesn't necessarily mean that because there's a lot of other things that's dependent on like the CPU and the SSD and all that kind of stuff. But it's saying hypothetically, 12 teraflops allows us to be just like absurdly fast in in terms of rendering inputs, you know, which can allow for super high graphical output, which just basically means this is going to be an absurdly beautiful console in terms of what it can produce visually at least on a theoretical level but this is where i get really confused on this is because i understand or actually we'll say we'll say this point for the next category because this is where i want to get into it so the second category is called immersion in an instant where he talks about and i'll go quicker over these he talks about ssd storage which i think is the the number one highlight of this section talks about basically every aspect of gaming improving with ssd he talks about games being larger more dynamic and things loading faster than ever before, just super fast everything. Quick resume, which is something I'm really excited about. Quick resume allows you to continue multiple games from a suspended state almost instantly, returning you to where you were and what you were doing without waiting through long loading screens. Dynamic latency input, which is really helpful for you know your MLG players out there, uh, where basically they're gonna lower the latency between input on your controller, your wireless controller and, you know, response on the screen, which, you know, which is really good for, like I said, all you MLG fuckboys out there, it just makes the game more precise, responsive, even though I don't notice any latency ever because 
I never realized that was a problem already, but they're making it better. H, the next one is HDMI 2.1 Innovation. They're partnering with HDMI Forum and TV manufacturers to enable the best gaming experience features, such as auto low latency, variable refresh rates, and, and you know, again, just making it more more responsive, synchronous, and, and better than ever before. The last one is 120 FPS support. Of course, Series X can hypothetically output up to 120 frames per second, but like I was saying with my brother the other day, we both agreed that that's probably highly unlikely that we're going to see a lot of 120 frame per second games because people are going to develop for the lowest common denominator. So, you know, if you're making games for PC and PS5 and maybe even Nintendo Switch 2.0 or whatever the hell they're making games for, you're going to develop for whatever the lowest common denominator is. So if whatever the lowest console, the lowest powered console is, it can only really max out 60 FPS or barely more than 60 FPS. Then third party pub- developers are going to make games that really lock in at 60 FPS. But if everyone has a super beefy console that can do 90, 120 FPS, then sure, maybe they'll take advantage of this. But this is something I see very few developers really utilizing. But nonetheless, it's cool that your console is technically powerful enough to output it. But like I was saying, the most in- the most important point of this section is the SSD storage. Um, because the thing I'm really hung up on, I get SSD. It's like... Y- that it's very expensive, but it makes, you know, everything boot up super fast and run super fast. And it's, it's a far superior storage method than a standard spinning disc hard drive. And I understand it's like, we've been waiting for this technology to get cheaper so that we can integrate it in more, in, in more hardware devices. But here's my issue with SSD. I understand it's such an expensive technology that I can't fathom the Xbox series X at most will have more than a terabyte of SSD on board. And that's pretty generous itself. Like I honestly, I wouldn't even be surprised if it was like 500 gigabytes of SSD on board. Um, but maybe they'll go for a terabyte just because game files are just getting so outrageously big these days. But the problem with that is if you only have 500 gigs or a thousand gigs of SSD on your console, then what are you going to do when all that fills up in two seconds? Like it did on, you know, the Xbox one, the Xbox one X, you know? So what, what are you going to resort to? Does that mean if I plug in an external, you know, standard hard drive, like I currently have for my Xbox one, if I plug something like that into my series X, that the games that are downloaded to my regular hard drive are going to low and load and perform a lot worse than games that are installed to my onboard SSD on the console because that's faster or like that's going to be create a huge problem real fast because again, you know, games take up so much storage these days. It's not uncommon to see games in like the 80 to hundred gigabyte range of, for a download that it's like, how are we going to put a lot of SSD on board the console? And not a lot of people will be able to buy, you know, external SSDs to add onto their console. So it's like, how is this really going to affect game performance when, you know, we rely on SSD to make the games perform a certain way, but SSD technology is so expensive that we can't put a lot of it on board to begin with. So we're constantly just shuffling things around our hard drive, deleting stuff, making room for new stuff. And I just don't understand. I feel like that's a huge thing that no one's really brought up yet. It's a big talking point and it's a big hurdle to overcome. And I'm really interested to see kind of how they address it. I don't know if I hit the nail on the head there. I really don't understand what I'm talking about enough to really know. Um, But nonetheless, I think that's going to be a a pretty big issue that not a lot of people have brought up yet. So interested to see how that works out. And then the final category, which we'll just blast through because it's a lot less important to me, is the, he calls it the next generation of game compatibility. I feel like we kind of already talked about this, but there is one point I want to really get into. So the first two that I'm not too crazy about, or that aren't like too groundbreaking, we, we already know about, is of course four generations of gaming as they call it, which is backwards compatibility, um, which means that, you know, all your OG Xbox, Xbox 360, Xbox One games will work on Xbox Series X. The whole idea being that now everything is forwards and backwards compatible and we just play games on xbox without having to worry about compatibility um, which is of course a massive uh, benefit uh, but we've already been enjoying that for the most part on the xbox one the other thing of course being game pass and and reiterating you know xbox games being uh, day one available on game pass and all that so those are just kind of reiterating points but this is the big one is he calls smart delivery This is basically what it reads word for word. It says, this technology empowers you to buy a game once and know that. 
whether you're playing the game on your Xbox One or your Series X, that you're getting the right version of the game for whatever Xbox you're playing on. We're making a commitment to use smart delivery on all of our exclusive Xbox Game Studios games, including Halo Infinite, ensuring that you will have to purchase a title once in order to play the best available version for whatever Xbox console they choose to play on. This technology is available for all developers and publishers, and they can choose to use it with titles that are released on Xbox One first and come to the Xbox Series X later. So this is like the the one tidbit from this. I'm like, okay, this is something we haven't really heard about. And so so buckle up. We got to talk about this one. So smart delivery. This actually answers a big question I know a lot of people have been sh- wondering about, which is, you know, we know, for example, we'll talk about Halo Infinite. They use Halo Infinite as the example. Halo Infinite will be available on Xbox One and Xbox Series X. But how exactly does that work? So normally, you know, in a console generation, let's talk about the Xbox One. You know, a game like Halo or a game like Call of Duty Advanced Warfare comes out and they make an Xbox 360 version and an Xbox One version. And of course, the One version is much nicer than the 360 version. But because the Xbox One has a low install base, because it's a brand new piece of hardware, they have to make two versions of the game, one for the old console, because that's what most people are playing on, and one for the new console, which of course is much nicer, but not a lot of people have yet because it's a brand new piece of hardware. However, since the Xbox Series X is this kind of console to end generations, we now are in the situation where, yeah, I mean, you can't develop Halo Infinite and just be like, all right, yeah, it just works on this old piece of hardware that wasn't initially designed to be forwards compatible with the future of gaming. And then it's also on the Xbox Series X, which is the most powerful console of all time. You can't really do that. So to an extent, yes, buying Halo Infinite on your Xbox One is kind of like buying a lower skew of the game. And then buying Halo Infinite on your Series X is kind of like buying a PC version of game. It's kind of like buying just a regular base game that can scale up or down depending on the hardware you're buying it for. But using this thing they're calling smart delivery, basically you can buy, I I, I mean, we don't know to, to the fullest extent exactly how this works, so it's somewhat speculation on my part. But hypothetically, you know, you can, let's say you have an Xbox One right now, you buy Halo Infinite on your Xbox One, and you don't plan on buying a Series X for another two years. Well, so now you have Halo Infinite, it's on the Xbox One, it looks, of course, it's the inferior version of the game because you're not playing on Series X or PC, and then in two years, you upgrade and you buy a Series X. Now you take your game that says Halo Infinite, the box says it's for uh, the Xbox One, and you put it in your Series X and you play it. Well, now Smart Delivery reads that as, well, hey, you're on a Series X right now. Even though the disc says it's the Xbox One SKU of this game, we're going to read it as the Xbox Series X SKU and give you the Xbox Series X version of the game to play. So this way you don't have to constantly rebuy games or pay additional fees to upgrade games or anything like that. It's just, you know, at the time you had an Xbox One, so you bought the game on that. Now you have a Series X, so you're playing the Series X version. You don't have to rebuy your game. And that's just another one of those consu- pro-consumer kind of blurring the line of console generations features that really makes it easy for people to kind of stay on the Xbox ecosystem. This is a crucial feature. This is critical. This is one of those things that this is how you get people to say, oh, Xbox Xbox is where I want to be. That's a, that's a pro-consumer feature. That's the kind of feature that makes all those cheap-ass finicky gamers which is how most gamers are really want to side with one one brand over the other because you know how gamers are where it's all about how much value can i get out of not a lot of money and the whole world owes me something because i'm an entitled brat who thinks 60 dollars for a game i get 500 hours out of is is still is still too much money somehow um so this is one of those features that's really going to give xbox a bunch of brownie points and make it a lot more stomachable for people to invest in i don't even know if that's a word to invest in xbox uh even if they're not going to buy a series x or whatever for a long time to come and i assume this works for for pc as well where it's like the basically the game is tied to your account so let less so to make that example again less so in a in a physical game situation more in like a digital game situation if you buy the game on your xbox one and play it on your xbox one and then later upgrade to a series x or start playing on pc but obviously that game purchase is still tied to your Xbox account, you're going to be able to play the PC version, the Series X version, whatever, because what's important is that you bought the game, not which version of the game you bought. So this is just, again, a huge deal, but the massive caveat here, which they address in the write-up, is that, yes, every Xbox Game Studios game ever, including starting with Halo Infinite, will, of course, support smart delivery, but it's up to the publisher, whether or not, the developer and the publisher, whether or not they want to support this. So, hypothetically, you know, Activision, a company that's notorious 
hilarious for being double dipping cheap assholes could be like, all right, so let's say the next, let's say this year's Call of Duty, it's not announced yet, but let's say this year's Call of Duty is Call of Duty Black Ops 5, right? So Activision could say, well, we're making an Xbox One and an Xbox Series X version of Call of Duty Black Ops 5, which you can buy this November. And then you you go, well, I'm not going to get a Series X for a few years, so I'm going to go buy the Xbox One version of Call of Duty Black Ops 5. And then in two years, you upgrade to a Series X. And you're like, okay, I want to play Call of Duty Black Ops 5 because I hate myself, and I'm going to play it on my Series X. If Activision decides, hey, we don't s- support smart delivery, then you might just be playing the Xbox One version of the game on your Series X. And they might say, hey, you want to play the Series X version? Go buy the Series X version. We're not supporting smart delivery. You have to buy our game twice. So this is up to the discretion of the publisher and the developer. This is Xbox doubling down saying all of our first party games will support this, but we can't speak for everyone else because we can't make everyone else do that because that's potentially leaving money on the table. It's similar in the way of, you know, not everything can be backwards compatible on Xbox 360 until they get the thumbs up and the flip switch from the publisher, the developer. And that's why it's been kind of slow getting all the 360 games backwards compatible backwards compatible although they've done a great job with that so that's a that's a little ranty but i think that's a massive talking point and it was just kind of buried in all that news i think honestly of all the many phil spencer uh, bits of information that came out this week that was the massive one so like i said yeah we're 42 minutes into the show and we've only been through two stories so i mean that was the bulk of the news was those two very big stories but we do have a bunch of other smaller stories so we'll get into that now um but yeah i'm actually really excited about that smart delivery because i think that will ease the mind of a lot of a lot of gamers moving forward with the, you know, where do I stand if I don't want to jump on the Series X right away, if I want to wait it out and see how I feel. Good news, whenever you buy a game, you're buying every version of the game, as long as it's at least an Xbox Game Studios game. But, you know, hopefully a lot of publishers and developers will adopt this in and everything. The last thing I want to say is, obviously, all this news might finally be enough to push Sony over the edge and speak. I know a lot of people have been really waiting for PS5 news. And Sony, like we all expected, February was going to be the month everyone expected to hear about the PS5, and Sony still hasn't talked. Um, Maybe this news dump, this info dump this week, will finally push Sony to make an announcement. The other thing is, I read all this news from Phil Spencer, and I'm starting to be in the camp. Again, I I talked with my brother about this last night. We both agreed. I'm starting to to be in this camp of, like, the Xbox Series X might be a $600 console. I I don't think... Mike, again, I don't think Microsoft is trying to position the Xbox Series X to be the best-selling console at launch ever made. I really think they're positioning this to be like, listen, we don't care. Play Xbox One, play One X, play Series X, play PC, play xCloud. We don't care. Play Xbox how you want, where you want, when you want, whatever. Because judging by these specs we're now learning, you know, 12 teraflops guaranteed, SSD hard drive, all this shit... It seems like they're saying, hey, we're making it so easy for you to play our games on any other platform that you don't have to have a Series X. So obviously the Series X is going to be mind-blowingly powerful, but we can't get that into a $500 or $400 box. This is a $600 machine. I definitely don't think for a single fucking second that Microsoft is making a $400 console. Anyone who thinks that the Xbox Series X is $400, write that off immediately. There's no chance in hell. Now, I think everyone's gotten pretty warmed up to the idea of $500, but I'm going to be... I'm going to be a little ballsy here, and I'm, I'm going to say it. I think there's a chance this is a $600 box, and I, I'm interested, like, what do you what do you think about that? I know, obviously, if you're listening to this show, you're probably a big Xbox fan. Are you willing to pay $600? Like, where, where do you stand on this? The only other time we've seen $600 in recent history is when Sony did that with the higher tier PS3 at launch, and that totally kicks, beat Sony in the ass. You know, they, they ate a lot of shit for that, but this is a very different gaming climate than it was in 2006. This is a very different scenario, the way Xbox is set up this generation. So things are different, but I'm interested to see. I would gladly pay $600. i would pay, I'd pay $1,000 for the next Xbox. I'm not, I'm not one of these people. I'm one of these people where it's like, if someone makes a good product, they deserve good money for it, you know? Like, Sonic Unleashed is, like, one of my favorite games of all time. It's a $60, 10-hour platforming Sonic the Hedgehog game. I'd pay $200 for that game, brand new. I think it's worth it because my experience with it is so good. I'd pay pay $500 for Halo 5. I think that game, the amount of enjoyment I've gotten out of that game and the amount of hours I've gotten out of that game, I think it's absolutely worth it. So I'm, I'm of the mindset that, you know, if this is a very powerful box and you need to charge $600 for it, then it's worth $600. But... I don't think a lot of gamers would stomach that cost, and so I'm interested what you think. But with these specs coming out to what what it looks like they're coming out to, I really don't even know if 500 is enough. 
uh, for this box. So interested to see what you guys think and how people react to it. But I could be wrong. You know, it's, it's Microsoft at the end of the day. They can eat the cost if they need to. Um, so maybe it is 500 but it sounds really, really beefy for a $500 box. So now I'm starting to worry if even that's enough money. Um, but who, who knows? We'll, we'll find out soon enough. So jumping into all of our other articles for the day, like I said, quicker ones, but our next story is that publisher Square Enix isn't planning on making next generation exclusives for a little t- for a little while as their current in development lineup is slated for current gen hardware. Thanks to the advantage of backwards compatibility on both Series X and PS5, the new this will make new Square Enix games playable for everyone. In an investor Q&A, President Yasuki Matsu- Matsuda said, quote, The next generation consoles will have backwards compatibility, so we plan for the time being to make our new titles available for both current and next-gen consoles, and therefore it will be somewhat further down the road when we release titles exclusively for next-gen consoles, end quote. So this actually kind of plays into the point we were just talking about. Maybe Square Enix will adopt the smart delivery service and... Meaning that, you know, let's say Marvel's Avengers, which comes out later this year, but pretty close to the Xbox Series X. Maybe that's a game where they'll make a where it's like you buy the game once and it just works on the Series X. Or maybe they'll make a Series X version and no matter which one you buy, it will work up and down. Or maybe they'll just be like, hey, we know both PS5 and Xbox Series X are backwards compatible and forwards compatible. So just so just play it wherever the hell you want to play it. It doesn't matter. Um, but I'll be interested to see how that pans out be- because that's that's a ballsy move to be like, hey, because we know, you know, because we know these these consoles offer backwards compatible, we don't feel the pressure to make something next gen for a while. But also important to note, Square Enix is a developer that usually doesn't put out too many games a year. They their developer or their publisher rather that puts out like a few games every now and again, especially their Japanese developed games. They they come out like once every like six to ten years. So like. It, it could be because considering that they Final Fantasy 15 was relatively recent for a Final Fantasy game, Kingdom Hearts 3 was very recent for a Kingdom Hearts game, and then in stuff like that, you know, it, it's not too impossible to think that maybe the next like big Square Enix game isn't coming out for a few years anyway. So maybe that's, you know, maybe this is kind of them like really playing around with the words to say like, hey, we don't even have anything big coming out for a little while. Of course, their Western teams do put out games more regularly, like like IDOS and, and Crystal Dynamics, of course, but we'll see. But nonetheless, this is a big move to make. This is me. I, I read this as Square Enix saying like, hey, we we see this as kind of the generation and all generations as well. Um, and, and the way I read this is like, this is all good for Microsoft. You know, Microsoft benefits a lot from this because it doesn't matter where you're playing Xbox, if you're playing Xbox. But to me, it kind of sounds like this hurts Sony a little more because from what we understand, the PS5 is like the next PlayStation, much in the way that like the PS4 was the next PlayStation at the time. And they're not so much initially planning on doing this more like last console kind of generation thing. So this could potentially, if PS5 is more of a regular cutoff where like no PS4 games on PS5 and stuff like that, this could potentially hurt Sony more than Xbox. But I think Sony's also going to get a little more loose uh, with in blurry with the lines of generations. They just haven't really gone out too much and, and said it yet, but we'll find out soon enough whenever they decide to stop internally fighting about pricing and coronavirus and just actually show people the damn box. But hopefully we'll get that pretty soon. Next one is our next story here is the February 2020 Xbox dashboard update is now rolling out. In fact, I just saw it today on my Xbox. I just played around with it. Um, so from the Xbox Wire, the new features you can look for are a simplified new home screen layout, uh, the new My Games and Apps UI update, the image and GIF support uh, conversations. So now you can now you can do GIFs and stuff like that in your Xbox conversations, um, including on the Xbox app on iOS and Android and Windows 10. You can view and install individual games bundled through Xbox Game Pass. And then, like for example, like Shenmue Collection, you can choose whether or not you're going to download Shenmue 1 or 2 first, which is really awesome. Um, but that's important to note that's like through Game Pass because they can't really control that for everything in the store. Also, there's a now you can choose a preferred location for your notifications and even more so that you don't, you know, you don't get all your Xbox notifications blown up on your Xbox, your Windows 10 PC, and your phone all at the same time. And then there's even more uh, mixer viewing improvements. Uh, so you can get more into that. You can read the Xbox Wire article for more information on that. And then there's some more storage management management suggestions to help you like free up space and have more room for games. Um, and they have a move option, which allows users to move external storage um, to like onboard storage and vice versa. So 
some new updates and a new UI look. Definitely check it out. I think it looks pretty good. But then again, I'm 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 kind of that Xbox user that always thinks whatever the latest Xbox update is looks good. I never have too much complaining. I know people usually complain a lot about the ads on the home screen. I've only seen one ad on my home screen, so it looks like they cleared it up. It looks a little more neat and tidy. So whatever. Still has the kind of live tile-ish look of Windows 8, which is all I care about. So who cares? Our next one, we'll just blast this because this one, I'm so tired of talking about this, but as if we didn't need more confirmation that Call of Duty Modern Warfare is getting a Battle Royale mode, some court documents revealed this week that Activision is attempting to subpoena Reddit to find the leakers for the game's leaked new game mode. Uh, Activision is filing a Digital Millennium Copyright Act subpoena against Reddit to discover the identity of the user who leaked the, quote, infringing Activision content. So basically, they're just trying to catch the guy who did it because obviously the guy who did it leaked legit information because if there was no battle royale mode activision wouldn't be after this guy they would just ignore it because there'd be nothing to go after so by way by virtue of them even going after this person they're just confirming even further that there is a battle royale mode but we already knew that because this shows up in the news in some form or fashion literally every single week um so yeah absolutely we're getting a battle royale mode in modern warfare at this point again it's just like they come out and and announce it activision we're tired of waiting it's like the worst kept secret in gaming right now, but just keep building up that hype for that if you're looking forward to that. And then our uh, our penultimate story of the of the week we've got from IGN. According to Kotaku, EA canceled another Star Wars game. The, um, this one having been happened just last year. The game was codenamed Viking, although details regarding Viking's plot and setting are secret. The report says that the planned it was planned to be a spinoff of Star Wars Battlefront with open world elements which sounds pretty interesting to me. But the article goes on to say, Star Wars game under the Uncharted director Amy Henning was canceled. EA Vancouver inherited some of the assets from that game called Project Ragtag to work on, which eventually became Project Orca. Uh, And then when Project Orca was also canceled, EA Vancouver began working on a third Star Wars project that was planned to be released in fall of 2020, which was this one we're talking about, Project Viking. According to Kotaku sources, Viking was being developed by EA Vancouver with the help of Criterion, who are best known for the Burnout series, uh, and they just actually took back the Need for Speed series as of last week from Ghost Games. Uh, unfortunately, the cross na- the cross national development and multiple studios involved created too many cooks kind of situation for the project, and the scope became too ambitious for its planned year and a half development time. Without wanting to extend the deadline, EA canceled the project in the spring of 2019, so roughly a year ago. EA still has several Star Wars projects in development, according to the report. A sequel to the wildly successful Jedi Fallen Order at Respawn, and a smaller, more unusual project from EA Motive, based in Montreal, which I assume is probably like a mobile game or something. Um, so we're getting we're getting some more... Star Wars, but yet another Star Wars game was canceled at EA. This one we didn't know about so much until very recently. And so I wonder, I don't know, I read this and I wonder if the cancellation was due to the development hell as they allude to, or if this is one of those things where like EA wanted to distance themselves from the Battlefront IP and and just, you know, garner that goodwill um, that people have been talking about that they've been trying to get uh, and focus more on Jedi Fallen Order, which is obviously a very different kind of Star Wars game. So I almost wonder if that had something to do with it. It just blows my mind, you know, that there are three Star Wars, three AAA Star Wars games that were canceled by EA all within like a two and a half year period. That says a lot more about EA as a publisher than it does about the developers responsible for these canceled projects. It's like, how are you, how are you EA? You're one of the most powerful and wealthy companies in all of the gaming industry. And you can't figure out a a timeline and a project deadline and a scope and everything to get three games out all three of them had to be mismanaged and, and, and canceled that just doesn't sound right to me it sounds like when you add up the cost for all three of these canceled projects they could have made at least one of them and recouped some costs but it blows my mind that absolutely all three of these games have been canceled and that actually sucks because even though i'm not a big star wars battlefront fan i would have liked to play this game just because that sounds kind of interesting i like the more I, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of star wars battlefront for the same reason i'm not a big fan of battlefield i just think dice makes some like really obnoxious shooters I, I hate the way they control i hate the way they feel like i i liked there are random exceptions like i liked battlefield 1943 i liked battlefield one i liked battlefield bad company the first one but like for the most part i hate pretty much everything dice makes i feel like their sh- their shooters like their gun mechanics are too float like they're too weighty and then the actual shooting other enemies like just doesn't feel right 
and that everything just feels like too big and too cumbersome to maneuver. I'm, I'm just usually not a big fan of their games, um, but this one actually sounds kind of interesting to me. I think that would have been cool to make it more story focused, less multiplayer focused, and to do some kind of open world like mission based stuff. I think that just would have been different and fun. But I guess they couldn't even make that because they had to. EA had to cancel yet another game. So, so now you know that's an, yet another, yet another Star Wars game we didn't get because EA is mismanaging the hell out of this IP that they have exclusive exclusive game publishing rights to. But uh, oh well. Our final story of the week, and this one actually kind of kind of sucks a little bit. Um, but a recent report from on MSFT Microsoft on Microsoft. I never know how that website kind of pronounces their name. Um, but they brought to light a team morale issue at Microsoft's streaming service Mixer and how they've reached an all time low in in overall team morale. Apparently, the service is being run by a small skeleton crew, and employees are in fear of being laid off as layoffs have been prevalent in the team in recent history. A new video that shows off the recently appointed Mixer head uh, Shilpa Yadla uh, giving a speech to the team shows a rather harsh representation of the way the team at Mixer is being treated. While the video is, of course, um, somewhat out of context and could be misconstrued, it certainly does paint a dire picture for the streaming service and the team that works at the at Mixer. This excerpt from the original article outlines the following issue. It says, quote, Mixer has had a rough few months that involved the original founders leaving from the business alongside a general manager and corporate vice president. However, what hasn't been reported is that over the last six months, we have been there have been 16 layoffs due to budget cuts, which have shed roughly 25% of the already skeletal team and are causing features released to slip schedules. That's according to Mixer employee who reached out to us concerned about the direction and fate of Mixer. During an internal Mixer town hall meeting last week, executives spoke of uh, to its skeletal to its skeleton crew of employees to address the growing sense of frustration and low morale within the business. Unfortunately, the words left a lot to be desired. Shilpa Yadla <laughs> butchering that had been meeting with employees one-on-one -on -one, presumably to assuade fears and concerns but on stage her words may have left a an adverse effect and then microsoft also response responded to earlier reports about these kinds of things the services struggling and the staff and everything but this was a few months before this story got out and at the time microsoft had said we have heard feedback from mixers community in our in our partners regarding areas where they uh, must improve or insert improve the service. We recognize the increasing video stability, better discovery, critical uh, capabilities, additional monetization opportunities, and broadening our market programs are critical and important to our streamers, and we are focused on supporting their success. Our new head of Mixer, uh, Yadla, is committed to addressing these critical needs and is delivering an incredible experience for my Mixer's streaming and viewers. The entire Mixer team is working tirelessly because behind the scenes on these new and innovative features to help maintain our positive welcoming culture as we continue to grow we expect 2020 to be an exciting year for mixer and the community of course that is in great contrast to what we just read and then as a reminder for those who don't know just last year uh, actually i think one of these excerpts mentioned but microsoft invested heavily in the streaming service by bringing on board some really notable streamer partners like ninja uh over from from main competitor twitch However, other higher management members, including the original co-founders, have both left the company in recent months. It appears that Microsoft has a lot of work and investment to make in order to help the service. But as it stands now, Mixer could be in some serious trouble. Um, so this is actually really disheartening to see. And if you guys look at the article, you can watch the two and a half minute excerpt of that new head of the studio kind of laying into the staff a little bit. Again, I don't know if it's out of context, but from what you see, it looks like she's being pretty hard on them. But this is really big trouble not only if, of course most importantly for the staff members who are being affected the people who've lost their jobs and you know the overall morale of the team but let's let's remember last fall they brought ninja on board and a bunch of other high profile streamers from from twitch and that there was a massive temporary surge in like viewership on twitch but you know i i are on mixer rather but i follow mixer like i i don't watch it religiously but but i try to watch it a little bit here and there just to kind of keep up with what's happening over there and the service really has not grown much since Ninja and others were brought on board. I was watching the other day. I can't remember what game I was trying to, I was looking for, but I was just like so shocked and dumbfounded by like the low number of, 
of viewers on every channel. I, I'm sure when Ninja gets online, you know, everything surges and a lot of people watch. But it's like the biggest channels on the on the stream, like the biggest streams going on at any given time are only like two or three thousand people strong. And then you go over to Twitch and you see the same game being played. And the biggest streams for those games over on Twitch are like 30, 50 something thousand people watching. So it's like like Mixer is still like substantially like lower in terms of viewers than Twitch is. And it's still really lagging far behind. And even though there was a lot of buzz for Mixer as a result of some of those big shakeups last year, it doesn't look like it's really gotten too many people on board with the service. And I don't know, in, in, in all the years I've been following Mixer, I've been following Mixer ever since it was called Beam. And it's like, I've seen it grow a little bit, but it's really kind of stagnant for the most part. And this is one of those things where it's like, is Microsoft going to double down and give them a bunch of money and a bunch of team members and really let them sort out the issues and, and fix Mixer, make it the best it can be? Or are they going to do the thing Microsoft historically does and kind of throw a little bit of money at it and then let it like kind of wither and die and just kind of dilapidate for years and then pull the plug on it because, you know, a small team wasn't able to make magic happen with little talent and little money or, or you know, not enough of a staff and, and little money. And I really hope that doesn't become the case because as as a Microsoft fan in general, I've watched this happen way too many times where a good a good piece of hardware or a good service or something just gets the plug pulled on it because Microsoft was negligent and really, you know, doing the best to make the thing work. And I really don't want to see that happen, but it looks like that's the, the road Mixer's heading down. And I really hope maybe the story getting out sends a message to Microsoft and maybe for the sake of PR, they really want to patch things and, and go out of their way to invest in Mixer and then kind of turn it around and spin it in a positive PR way. Um, but maybe this is just, you know, the writing on the wall and like the first public um, inclination that really Mixer is struggling and probably won't make it, which I hope isn't the case, but I've been, I've been hurt a lot from Microsoft when it comes to canceling projects and services that I really love. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if Mixer is just the next one in a, in a long, unfortunate list. Um, so that's going to do it for our, our stories this week. A lot of big bulky stories. I appreciate you hanging on. I know we're kind of going way over compared to how we normally do, but some tidbit stories to really just run through real quick. Adult Swim's games and Japanese developer Solio Games have announced a new game based in the animated series Samurai Jack, which will make its way to Xbox and PC this summer. Additionally, we got Swedish Dev Experiment 101 delivering fans an update regarding the status of RPG Biomutant. They state that the game is still in development, although no release date has been revealed as of yet. Just don't think that it's been canceled because it has not. Also, Bungie, they have announced that the popular Trials of Osiris mode will be returning to Destiny 2 on March 13th. As part of the season of the Worthy update, the mode will ship with three new maps being brought back from the original Destiny, as well as a sandbox overhaul. And lastly, the backwards compatible Xbox 360 game Castle of Illusions starring Mickey Mouse has reappeared on the Microsoft Store and is once again available for digital purpose. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember, but a while ago that was removed from the store and fell victim to the kind of uh, license ag agreement expiring and then the game going away forever. Thank God this one's back because it's good to see more games kind of be able to be preserved and stay on forever. If you are worried about ever getting a chance to play a game where you wanted to play it, but it went away before you got the chance to download it. Now would be a good time to just jump on it before it goes away again. You never know. Um, but yeah, then we got this week's Xbox releases. There are 21 games coming out this week. So Holy hell. I'm this episode's already running really long. I'm not going to waste your time trying to make bad jokes about everything. So just the notable ones, kingdom hearts, three remind, uh, that's the new DLC for Kingdom Hearts 3. Also, Kingdom Hearts 3 is now on Game Pass. So do yourself a favor, unsubscribe to Game Pass, take your Xbox, lock it in a safe, throw it in the bottom of the ocean, forget about it. Um, but we also got some other games coming out this week. Uh, notable ones would be Ark Survival Evolved Genesis Part 1, whatever the hell that means. We got Mega Man Zero ZX Legacy Collection, which is out this week. We've got Sayonara, Sayonara as the white man calls it. Wild Hearts, which looks like a good indie game with some purple colors, so that's fun. And a bunch of other little indie games, indie games, indie games, indie games. House Flipper, which actually sounds kind of interesting to me, but check out Xbox Wire if you want to go over all that in more detail. The last notable one being Yakuza 0, which is also coming to Game Pass. It's actually out now. Um, I definitely want to actually check that out. I've always wanted to get into the Yakuza series, although from what I understand, the 
Yakuza Zero is a little different from some of the other entries in the in, in the series, so I don't, I don't know. But if you've ever been interested in that popular Sega series, check out Yakuza. There are not a lot of Japanese games on Xbox, so that'd be fun to check out. As a reminder, Games with Gold, we actually have our March announcement for Games with Gold. So just to recap for the last time, for February, you got TT Isle of Man for the rest of the month. You got Call of Cthulhu until March 15th. It just started in mid-February, and we got that till mid-March. So download that. And then the original Xbox OG version of Star Wars Battlefront, which is available for the rest of the month and the next next few days. So go ahead and download those. But for March, we already have our games announced. Our four new games for the month of March are Batman, The Enemy Within, The Complete Season. So go ahead and d- download that throughout the whole month of March. You've got Shantae Half Genie Hero, which is actually a really fun platformer uh, game. If you've ever if you've never played one of those, highly recommend it. It will be available from mid-March to mid-April. And then on the 360 side, we've got Castlevania Lords of Shadows 2, which will be available for the first half of March. And then Sonic Generations, which will be available for the second half of March. Guys, please play Sonic Generations. I know people love to hate on Sonic. Sonic's got a little bit of attention right now with that movie doing kind of well. But play Sonic Generations. If you've ever hated the 3D Sonic era particularly, Sonic Generations, while not my favorite 3D Sonic game, is the prime example of how good 3D Sonic can be. And I think it's absolutely worth your time. If you've never played Sonic Generations, either go play that and 100% it and get all the achievements or go kill yourself and never listen to my show again. Uh, And with that said, on that positive note, we will end things. Thank you so much for your time and your consideration to listen to my hour and 10 minute show about Xbox and ranting and Phil Spencer and Sonic the Hedgehog. I appreciate it as always. Remember, go leave very positive reviews, very big self-esteem booster reviews. Go ahead, follow me on the Twitter and Instagram and vote for my presidential candidate and do everything I want you to do. Only say nice things about me. And until next time, Eric is going to take it away with a beautiful, succulent, soul, sultry song. Thank you, Eric.